Last week, the MD and CEO of Equitas Small Finance Bank resigned from the firm 15 years after he founded Equitas as a microfinance institution. He was instrumental in securing the Small Finance Bank license for the firm in 2016. But Vasudevan is not the only SFP CEO and MD to have left his job. Last year, Nitin Chok had also resigned as the MD and CEO of Ujjivan Small Finance Bank. Good morning, my name is Ishan Gera and welcome to the Business Standard Banking Show. In today's episode, we'll cover the important developments of the week, including Supreme Court decision to expedite check bounce cases. We also speak with Chandrasekhar Ghosh, CEO and MD of Bandhan Bank, while a decoded section explains what cardless ATM cash withdrawal is and how it affects you and the banks. For our take two, we have Tamal Bandopadhyay, consulting editor Business Standard, dissecting the HDFC HDFC Bank merger. But first, here are the banking developments of the week. Last week, the Supreme Court ordered the setting up of special courts to deal with a mountain of check bounce cases that have piled up in various courts across the country. The court had taken cognizance of the problem in 2020 and found that a sixth of all criminal pendency in the courts was made up of check bounce cases under the Negotiable Instruments Act. The Apex Court ordered the special courts to be set up in Maharashtra, Delhi, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan, five states with the most number of pending cases. These courts will be presided over by retired judges which will help free up court resources. That should bring some cheer to parties to these cases, the court system and also to the banks. Talking about resolutions, RBI was not keen on granting on-tap licenses to entities applying for bank licenses. In a change of tag, the central bank, instead of releasing a list of entities approved, announced the entities which had been rejected. Of the 11 entities which had applied for banking licenses, six were rejected by RBI, whereas the remaining five applications are still under consideration. Apart from Chaitanya India Fin Credit, the applicants whose licenses were rejected are UAE Exchange and Financial Services Limited, the Repatriates Cooperative Finance and Development Bank Limited, Repco, and Pankaj Vesh and others. Vsoft Technologies Private Limited and Calicut City Service Cooperative Bank Limited were found to be not suitable for on-tap licenses of small finance banks. While the RBI rejects applications for on-tap licenses, another idea seems to have fallen out of favor with the banking system. Asset reconstruction companies did not take off the way RBI wanted them to and then there was a talk of a bad bank too. Last week, we saw the exit of another bank from ARC Business. IDBI Bank sold its entire 19.18% equity in the Asset Reconstruction Company, Asset Reconstruction India Limited or ARCEL. IDBI sold its entire stake to Avenue India Resurgence Private Limited, an arm of a New York headquarter global investment firm, Avenue Capital Group. As IDBI exits ARCEL, HDFC Bank is doubling down on its rural base. The bank announced that it shall make rural banking a separate vertical and shall open 1,060 semi-urban and rural branches in the current financial year. In this regard, it also announced a partnership with Institute of Rural Management based in Anand, Gujarat to create Rural First Strategy to track consumer behavior, customer satisfaction, service design and service delivery. At present, only half of the HDFC Bank's branches are in rural and semi-urban areas. From India's soon-to-be largest private sector bank, let's move on to the newest banking entity, Bandhan Bank, which started as a microfinance institution, received approval from RBI for a banking license in 2014. Since then, the bank has had shares of ups and downs and was listed on the bourses in 2018. In an interview with Business Standards banking editor Manojit Saha, Chandrasekhar Ghosh, CEO and MD, Bandhan Bank discusses the bank's performance. Business Standard Banking Show. Uh, Bandhan Bank recently announced it, uh, its fourth quarter results, in which its net profit uh, more than doubled sequentially. Uh, its margin improved and asset quality also improved. To speak more about the results and the bank's road ahead, we have Mr. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, CEO and MD, Bandhan Bank. Mr. Ghosh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Asset quality of the bank has improved substantially. The collection efficiencies in March were over 95%. Does that give you confidence 
that the worst is over and, uh, and FY23 will be a normal year? All this is the parameter, the link with this, the customer mm -hmm. business point of view. When I go to this, the ground level, you see that customer people are started their business. Mm -hmm. When they open the business and running the business, automatically their repayment has come back and NPA has come down and credit demand also increase, which have been shown very good performance in the last quarter, which is 15% higher than the pre-pandemic disbursement. So that it has been given the confidence, customer demand has coming back. Customer demand is coming back. Come. Uh, what about uh, Assam? <coughs> there were some problems in Assam earlier in terms of uh, collections. So Assam situation has also improved, is it? No, if you see that the Assam collection efficiency now is aligned with the national collection efficiency. National collection efficiency is a 99%, Assam is a 98%, which is 1% lower. It's a good on that, the coming back to this position. I hope that that is a very good way given on that. Sir, so, um, Bandhan Bank's margin in, four, in the fourth quarter was 8.7%, highest in the 11 quarters. Now that interest rates are rising, uh, do you think such kind of margins will be sustainable? No, if you see that the, the what is the cause behind of this? Right. The one side is in common, that is NPA has recovered. No, yes. which is the 2% and uh, I say that the total portfolio has been uh, recovered in the last quarter. That have been helped us to increase the this. And second point, if you see that the, <coughs> sorry, our uh, the operational profit has come as a 53%, which is the, the bank life isn't good. Right. So that have been helped us to reach on this 8.7 but normally if you see that our our name is a 7.5 to 8.5 always lies on that so i hope that it can be like to sustain but not in a 8.7 but around the six, eight around eight around it uh, bandhan started operations in august 2015 it's almost seven years the bank uh, bank is uh, bank is running Bandhan uh, migrated from a microfinance institution to Universal Bank. In the seven years, your microfinance portfolio is still 50% of the total loans. What is the roadmap to reduce uh, or to diversify uh, your, your uh, lending portfolio? Okay. So this is a not to reduce the portfolio. This is a, a, I say that the diversified and mixed the portfolio. We take group loan and non-group loan secured loan and secured loan so uh, as a bank when uh, seven years before we are open the bank that time my 98 percent was in a micro credit loan which is a group loan that has now come 47 percent right. we have the plan on that the next uh, the three years we like to uh, reduce or, or go to this uh, diversify in the 26 percent so there is a two way one way is there the we have the 13 million borrowers in microcredit, Correct. which is the 50% of this borrower average uh, 10 years with us. Correct. So these the borrower are very matured, very good enterprise developed. Right. So they have not any uh, like as a microcredit, one lakh rupees loan or one lakh fifty thousand rupees loan. So we are graduating them is a different process and system. And in a normal credit, which is like as in same as MSME. So that is also 25% of my group loan customer as in, as in portfolio basis have been graduated last two years to the formal credit. That have been helped me to reduce Correct. on that. Correct. But there is no difference between two. Only they are, uh, one difference is a group loan. We are going to the group meeting collection in this weekly basis and carry from the field to the office. And these loan are very differently assessed from the credit bureau, family income, and the credit bureau, all types of, uh, there is a credit bureau record. And then we are provided the credit and they are not attend the group meeting. They are coming to this, the 
monthly installment, it has been deducted from their account, which is the normal methodology on that. So that is, is a very good portfolio. Quality of the portfolio is better because they are very seasoned customer of that. So it has been helped us on that. that this two type of customer interest rate is not very any difference on that. Okay. So that it is not coming to the impact of my name on this. So for that reason, we are like to increase some of the housing loan has come very good. MSME loan has come good. So that have been also gradually coming the growth, which helped us to diversify and making on that the group loan will become 26% by next three years. By next, by 2025. 2025. 2025. You acquired uh, uh, Grew Finance, which also helped you diversify your book, you entered the home loan space with that acquisition. Is any other organic growth, are you, are you, are you, are you open to more organic growth opportunities to further diversify your loan? Now, if you see that the, we are focusing in that four vertical. Right. One is in the, we called that the microcredit or we say whatever we say that group loan. We are good enough. We are 20% market share, including group and graduated individual. We like to continue on that way. Second point of that, if it is the housing loan. Housing loan is a big opportunity in our country, especially in the affordable housing, which we have been taken as a group. Right. So that is also growing last two quarter, especially in the last quarter, given the fantastic growth of this, the vertical. Right. Its growth has not uh, given any of the life of the group. So there is a second. Third is a MSME. We like to build up the MSME portfolio on our own. Okay. No. And, uh, and the fourth is uh, we have uh, the, some retail, some like uh, the gold loan, personal loan, these are all are making two-wheeler loan or auto loan. It will be also homegrown because we have the 65 lakhs customer in the bank branches. Right. There is an opportunity is more to get some customers demand from those customer, uh, those those the vertical, and then then this credit will be grow on that. So for that reason, I have not need to grow in the bank for further any of the inorganic way. It's an, it's an automatically my home grown will be like to make. You are saying that because you have so many customers reaching them with those loan portfolios will be good enough for your growth. Correct. You don't have to look for inorganic opportunities. Correct. Sir, uh, the loan growth has been extremely healthy for Bandhan Bank, particularly uh, in the fourth quarter as you were saying. So uh, for the current financial year, what kind of loan growth you are expecting? No, if you see that the loan growth has come in this financial year, uh, year on year basis, 14%. Right. If you see the quarter on basis, this is 13%. Right. That means whatever the growth has come, growth has come to the last quarter. Right. Because of the first two quarters have been second wave have been severely affected on that. Right. So growth has not come. Right. So little bit growth has come third quarter and finally has come fourth quarter. Normally financial industry Fourth quarter always is a very good growth has given. Right. So I feel that the, this financial also will be come to this more than normal growth, which is compared to the last financial year. So you you, you see growth will be more more from from the last financial year. The last financial. But the interest rates are also increasing. Do you think that could impact loan growth to some extent? If you see that the our major focus is the retail customer. Right. Retail customer, they have need the business loan mm. and which is the tenure is a very short term. Mm. So without a loan, they are not running their business. Right. I have not seen that the some basis point increase that can be impact to their loan growth. Correct. So this is, I am not feeling on, but if it is a further increase mm -hmm. or long term, it will be like to continue with it's a big increase. High that may be like to little bit impact. Bandhan Bank has opened more than 300 branches in the last financial year. Do you plan to expand your branch in such an aggressive way? We have opened that in the 300 plus branches in the last year. Mm -hmm. This year we have the plan on that to the open 530 branches. 
and the major of these branches more than 80 percent will be other than east south west north will be like to penetrate on those areas so you are planning to have more pan india presence pan india presence we are already in the presence in the pan india 34 states we are out of 36 uh, but we will be like to more penetrate of those states penetrate. but i mean what, what is the reason for opening so much branches because most of the banks uh, are saying that it's digital, they are going digital, so physical branches will not be open. What is the reason for you to open branches? No, I am I am saying that the <coughs> as per our learning from the seven and a half years, the customer has the first trust on that physical branch. Ah. And gradually we'll be like to transform them from physical to digital. So without a bank branch, we we cannot give gap give that comfort. If you see the customer first feel that if I like to open the account, if I have the, some challenge, where I can go? No, who will be my the relationship officer? No, yes, I can do my mobile, but not that much comfort right. in the beginning. So you have need on that the physical branch to reach to the more people and acquire them to this the branch. And gradually we educate them with a digital transaction. And they will be like to convert. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh, for talking to us. Thank you. In the interview, Ghosh tells Business Standard that the bank's consumer business is getting stronger and also lays down a roadmap to diversify its loan portfolio, which is still heavily tilted towards micro loans. One of the problems that microfinance institutions like Bandhan solved was the ease of access to funds. This ease of access approach has since permeated in all aspects of banking, especially payments and transactions. RBI is taking it a step further. The central bank has announced guidelines for cardless cash withdrawals at all ATMs. The move will benefit customers for sure, but will it be as good for banks? Let's find out about the process and what this means for the banking ecosystem. The RBI's decision to allow cash out at ATMs via UPI promises to be a game changer. It can help banks earn more by way of interchange as the number of transactions is likely to go up. The big takeaway is that banks now have a chance to monetize UPI transactions which are free as of now. UPI transactions have crossed the 5 billion mark. There's an entire generation of consumers who may have only used UPI so far and not debit cards. They can be potential new users for bank ATMs. The RBI has also allowed interoperable cardless cash withdrawals. This means you can withdraw cash at an ATM different from your card issuing bank and that too without a debit card. Banks can charge 17 rupees for each of these transactions, thereby creating a new revenue stream. This RBI decision can also lead to more business for firms that help banks move cash like CMS, SIS Procedure, Secure Value and Brink Aria, which cut almost 70% of the daily average of 15,000 crore rupees in cash. But it's not all positive for banks. More cash withdrawals at ATMs may also increase their cash loading charges. This is especially true since there are more 500 rupees notes in circulation compared to 2000 rupees notes. This only means more trips by cash vans to replenish ATMs with lower denomination notes. On the other hand, we may also lead to banks installing more recyclers. What are recyclers, you may ask? Well, these are ATMs which not only dispense cash but also accept deposits. At present, India has more than 2,50,000 ATMs out of which nearly 35,000 or 14 odd percent are recyclers. However, of the 12,000 odd ATMs replaced every year, the share of recyclers has now gone up to nearly 95 percent.
I'm backed by the nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. The easing of regulatory requirements is also the reason HDFC and HDFC Bank finally decided to announce their long-awaited merger. In a session with us, Tamil Bandhupadhyay dissected the merger while also hinting at what investors can expect in the coming few months. Hi, Tamil. Thanks for coming on the show again. Thank you. Let me start with this question. Uh, it was very interesting that you started with the analogy of waiting for God. But when it comes to mergers in India, the, the phrase that comes to my mind is once bitten, twice shy. Can you tell us about the history of mergers in India and how they've worked? Because you mentioned the ICICI and ICICI bank merger in your article this week. Yeah, let's let to cut a long story short, there are many mergers because um, in many cases, uh, you know, the Reserve Bank of India was a sort of what, what would I call an investment banker uh, uh, at the background. So whenever a bank was falling, uh, RBI uh, came to the rescue uh, through the back door, asking someone else to pick it up. So that's the history yeah. of bank mergers. Um, you know, there are very few mergers actually where, where the two banks wanted to merge. Uh, for instance, uh, the Kotak ING is one such case. But in most yes. of the cases, RBI uh, played the um, investment banker for the for the sake of financial sector stability. The ICICI that's happened in 2003, and subsequently even IDBI. But that's a separate story because both ICICI and IDBI were development financial institutions. Mm -hmm. HDFC now, and HDFC merger is a separate story. Now, coming back to that story, what has changed in terms of landscape and market requirements for HDFC to initiate this now? Well, you you said that uh, I started with the waiting waiting for Godot, uh, Samuel Beckett, where Godot is an enigmatic figure. People keep on waiting. Uh, the two gentlemen, Didi and other person waiting uh, for it and it never appeared. So typically we all talk about something we expect to happen and probably never happen. That's the waiting for Godot concept. Mm -hmm. Now here, if you see uh, for the past 20 years, uh, there have been talks that HDFC yes. and HDFC by Maja because uh, uh, globally there are very few financial institutions and in India probably there's one uh, HDFC, which is one product institution. You know, yes. only the mortgage, that's one part of it. And yeah. second part of it, you see the HFC, stroke NBFC, holding 21% in a bank. The bank in turn holding 100% in another NBFC, which HDFC does. It's mm -hmm. a sort of bit of odd uh, in the Indian financial architecture. Okay. So there have been uh, discussion with Reserve Bank of India. I mean, I don't know whether it's official uh, with HDFC that you need to do something about it. Now, mm -hmm. one way of sorting this out, what could be uh, going for a whole post structure, but then this has tax implications and then valuation gets diluted. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other option is the merger with HDFC with HDFC Bank, which uh, both Mr. Parekh and Tiki Mistri, if you look at history for the past 20 years, have been saying, no, it doesn't make any sense because of the regulatory requirement, SLR okay. and CRR, the large balance sheet HDFC has, if you factor in those kind of requirements, uh, it's, it's the cost is huge. So all along, uh, the logic of not merger was this. Mm -hmm. But HDFC was, the bank was very keen that, look, I mean, we can't have a, a, a product basket where the mortgage does not exist. Yeah. Uh, which is why at 2003, they got into kind of arrangement where HDFC bank started outsourcing the loan for HDFC. And mm -hmm. for that, it was earning some fees and it has the option of keeping part of it on its book. That was the kind of arrangement. Yeah. And HDFC high manager, the senior management was all along saying, no, it's not the time. And suddenly in the first week of April, I was in US. <laughs> so I, I just heard that uh, it got matched. And if you remember, just 10 days back, 10, 12 days back, I think 21st or 22nd March HDFC announced that for the first time in its history, it had given, uh, it had, it had uh, sanctioned uh, $2 trillion that look, uh, the, the requirement has now come down. Uh, mm -hmm. SLR is now 18%, uh, 
The CRR was 4% when it was announced. Now it has gone up to 4.5%. Yeah. So the regulatory cost has come down. Uh, of course, uh, PSL is an issue, uh, which, uh, but the large, but there is a segment of uh, HDFC's existing loan, which is a low cost housing loan, yes. can be considered um, as a party sector lending. But still, there's a gap. But there are two things we need to you, you need to uh, you need to understand we need to appreciate here one is this merger is still 12 to 15 months away yeah. so over that period of time hdfc can uh, i mean hdfc bank can figure out how to sort this out um, you know uh, get more liquidity so on and so forth hdfc bank on the other hand has enough liquidity uh, mm -hmm. so to, to take care of that and um, we, we heard Mr. Parekh saying that they have approached Reserve Bank of India for some kind of dispensation. Now, if the dispensation happens, then it's good. Uh, I mean, then the merger uh, will become value accretive, yeah. quote unquote, for, for the investor's point of view. Now, yeah. will Reserve Bank of India give this grant this dispensation? Historically, we have seen that it has not. Like in case of uh, ICICI Bank, it did not. On day one, ICICI Bank had to fulfill uh, all the all the requirement like SLR, CRR, and PSL. If I am not mistaken, they had to buy PSL, uh, the private sector lending, private sector loan from State Bank of India. That's where it is made. Yeah. So in this case, in this case, uh, I don't know whether the Bank of India will be willing to make a change and grant them the dispensation of uh, phasing out. If it does not, so in that case, the the capital which would have been used for growth needs to be used. Uh, for to meet regulatory requirements. There are certain kind of loans which an HFC can have it on its books, but a bank cannot have it. You know, particularly the construction loan, which have been used for the purpose of buying land or the yeah. loan given against shares. So there yeah. are certain part of it, which a bank cannot. Uh, so HDFC bank will probably have to sell it off. Sell, not probably, will have to sell it off. It cannot have it off. Okay. But again, I'm repeating, the merger is 12 to 15 months away. So in this 12 to 15 months, I think some of the, those kind of loans may be already paid and will go down. Uh, and similarly, the liquidity also, they will probably manage in a better way because there's a long rope given to them. I mean, there are various yeah. regulatory um, nods required. And for that, it will take, I think, earliest we can think of sometime probably September 2020. This is very interesting because you just mentioned it about the regulatory requirements, capital requirements coming on par between NBFCs and uh, banks. And you mentioned it in your article also how things have changed since the past. Now, uh, will we look at more mergers in the future given the given the scenario that is happening? One of the reasons of uh, why this merger is taking place or they have opted for merger with Mr. Parekh gone on record, apart from the regulatory requirements coming down, which means the cost of merger coming down. Also, the arbitrage opportunities, the arbitraging between banks and NBFCs are going down because the banks are NBFCs now virtually are being treated on a par. Uh, the asset classification loans, uh, which was very different for NBFCs, now it's almost uh, it's like banks. I mean, a loan turns bad at certain period, both for banks as well as NBFCs, and the. Uh, Another important thing that the, the, the LCR, the liquidity requirement, also yeah. now NBFC is to be liquid. It is given a roadmap, uh, particularly in a scale-based uh, approach, which RBI uh, now has adopted. The larger NBFCs, uh, HDFC is one of them. Okay, there is not much of difference between banks. And banks. Now, with that lead, lead to more mergers, I, would, I am not very sure, but definitely more NBFCs will be now uh, would like to become banks because mm -hmm. the advantage you have the soft touch regulations no more there. So why not become a bank and access uh, cheaper liquidity in the form of deposits? Mm -hmm. So I think more than mergers, I would like to believe that more uh, more entities will knock at the Reserve Bank of India's door uh, for uh, bank licenses. Got a point. Now, one concern that I have is the system creating too many too big to fail entities, which a crisis may at the end obliterate. Am I right in my assessment, or is that not the case? No, it's it's not actually. If you see in the, uh, say in in this case, both HDFC among the NBFCs and and HDFC Bank among the banks, 
were already in that category. So it's mm-hmm. not you are by merging them, you are not creating uh, uh, yet another institution which is too big to fail. Both of them in their own rights, going by their size, uh, they were uh, in that cat- category uh, among the NBFC and the banks. And we need large banks. We need the scale. If you look at the global uh, uh, the, the stacking order of banks, I mean, State Bank of India is the only bank which is among the top 50 banks. Yes. The top, among the top 10 banks, you'll be the mostly representation from China. So we are not, even after this uh, HDFC bank, uh, the new HDFC bank post yeah. margin will be uh, roughly about double or a little more than double or about double of ICICI bank, but far, far smaller compared to State Bank of India. Okay. So we need larger banks. We need bigger bank, uh, mm-hmm. definitely. So uh, I don't agree with you that we are creating a systemic, we, we will create a systemic crisis by creating more uh, uh, big institutions who are too weak to fail. We need larger, we need more banks and we need larger banks, which is why also, if you have seen, the government of India has gone for consolidation within the public sector bank undertaking. Now we have 11 banks and in some cases two banks, in some cases three banks, uh, they have got merged to create the scale. Got your point. That's about it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time this week and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Kamal believes that it would take anywhere between 12 to 18 months for things to get finalized and by then the bank would have had enough time to sort out regulatory concerns. Moreover, he also highlighted that the merger may mean for other NBFCs. He thinks instead of mergers, it will make more sense for NBFCs to apply for banking licenses. That's all from us this week. We'll be back next Thursday at 11 a.m. for more news and analysis. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.